feel like um, feel like the worship and song has been wonderful this morning. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know the tunes, the tunes on the songs are great. They're important. We try to have songs that are singable, but uh, I hope I hope you pay attention to the words. That's the main thing. Bible tells us that we teach each other with spiritual songs, and that's one of the things we're trying to do. We we worship in song. We worship in giving. We worship in the memory work. We worship as we share God's Word. So there's a lot of ways we worship. And then we leave here and we don't stop worshiping. You worship in the way you live. And so we want to make all of it count. Well, you just got seated, so I will leave you there. But please, in your heart, stand out of respect for the Word of God as we read from Luke 19, beginning in verse 11. And they heard these things. <laughs> Get the first word right, and then maybe we'll be okay going from there, right? As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The verse came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, your mina has gained five more. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you. Because you are a severe man, you take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put your money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them and slaughter them before me. Let's pray. Father, we um, humble ourselves before your word. We are inadequate, Lord, to, to understand or to represent, but you have given us as human beings the task of doing exactly that. You've certainly encouraged us that we must study, that we must know your word, that we must understand it, that we must apply it and live it. You've given us teachers with the reminder that they incur double condemnation should they fail to teach faithfully and clearly what your word says. We take all of those things seriously. And so we pray that by your Holy Spirit, Father, you will take this word and minister it to our hearts this morning. Thank you for all the wonderful ways and things we've already celebrated today. Lord, to be together, wonderful gift. To have Teresa be here, take time from her schedule before she goes, so grateful for her. We pray that you will bless her ministry in Bangladesh. Attend it with success. Success in terms of souls coming to know you, but we pray the same for all of our missionaries and for our own ministry here. Even the simple things, like the passing out of cookies yesterday and those that will perhaps go out later this week to our own individual neighbors, inviting them to a service on Christmas Eve. 
where the gospel will once again be presented. Will you make it clear? And Lord, will you bring people, just the ones who need to be here, to hear, to understand, and to come to faith in you. We pray for that. With all of our hearts, we pray for that. So bless us now as we study together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Famous um, author was doing, you know, what authors do. He had, he had written a book, and so he was on the book tour doing a book signing one day, and a guy ran up to him, and he said, Sir, would you please sign this book? It's for my wife for Christmas. And he said, Of course, I'll sign it. He said, I assume it's a surprise. And he said, I'll say it's a surprise. She's expecting a Cadillac. Well, I don't know how many of you are expecting a Cadillac for Christmas. I hope you get whatever you're expecting. But that woman certainly did not. Nor were the disciples of Jesus going to. Here's Jesus. At this point in time, he's about 17 miles from Jerusalem, heading for what he knows will be his last trip there. And he has an, he has an issue on his hands. The disciples are expecting what is not going to happen. They're expecting the kingdom to come. For Jesus to initiate this wonderful kingdom in place of the Romans, and it's not going to happen. So he once again tries to reset expectations, as he has been doing throughout this long journey, six-month journey to Jerusalem. This time by means of this parable. And the parable is going to teach them that far from assuming a throne in Jerusalem, he's going to leave them. He's going to leave them. They will be devastated. But they need to know some things that he's not going to leave them alone. They need to know that that's not the end of the story. And so he tells them this parable to help begin to fill in the blanks that they do not know yet. And it's important to us because we land right in the middle of this parable. Between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ, there we are. This is as applicable to us as it was to those who first heard it. So let's take a look at this parable. Four quick points on it. First of all, the removal. The removal. He says in verse 12, A nobleman came from a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. That's a little bit of strange language to us. How would a nobleman go to receive a kingdom? But it was very familiar to the audience that Jesus is speaking to. They were well familiar with this. Herod the Great, who had ruled over Palestine for 40 years leading up to the time of Christ and who ruled for about a year or two after Christ was born, got his kingdom from Caesar Augustus. He was named King of the Jews by Caesar. And because he was faithful to Caesar and tried to earn his way with the Jews, which he never quite accomplished because he was a son of Esau, he was an Edomite, and they hated him. He was able to rule because Rome saw him in good stead and he was able to rule for 40 years as king. But when he died, he divided his kingdom into three parts, each part going to one of his sons. The part that was in Jerusalem, the Judea and Samaria part, was given to a son named Aristarchus. And he was named an ethnarch. He went to Rome to get named king, and Caesar Augustus told him, look, I don't know you very well. I'm not sure that you're kingly material, so you're going to continue to be an ethnarch until you should, quote, according to Josephus' historian, Caesar told him, until you prove your just deserts, which it turned out that he could not do. And so Archelaus never became king. In fact, the Romans, the Romans were fed up with him within about 10 years. They kicked him out and put their own governor in place over that part of Palestine. And over the next several years, governors reigned on behalf of Rome in Samaria and Judea, the latest of which at the time of Christ was a man named Pilate. You'll remember his name, and we will see him obviously later in the history of Christ. But Jesus knew about noblemen going away to get a kingdom. So the nobleman in the parable, when we find a parable, the first thing we've got to do is figure out who are the component parts, right? What did they represent? Well, the nobleman in the parable is, has to be Jesus, right? He is the nobleman. He is the one that's going away to get a kingdom. So the 
parable to the disciples represents kind of a good news, bad news story. The bad news, Jesus isn't going to be setting up a kingdom yet. The good news, he's going away someplace to receive one. What the disciples don't realize yet, what just simply hasn't yet gotten through kind of their thick, you know, Galilean skulls, is that Jesus has to go to Jerusalem this time to suffer and die, to pay the penalty for the sins of the people that will become inhabitants of his kingdom, to make the entrance requirement and the entrance repayment for all of those who will come to faith in Christ. And so this is the thing that's going to happen in Jerusalem this time. Without the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus that happens there, there would be no people to populate a kingdom later on. The cross, in other words, had to come before the crown, as we've seen before. Now, even after his death, the disciples of Jesus struggled with this. Turn with me to the first chapter of Acts. If you're in Luke, just go past John to Acts chapter 1. And we'll see this brief period of time later, after his death and after his resurrection and after his ascension, Jesus took them out one day um, to, the, to the Mount of, um, of Olives that was just outside the city of Jerusalem. And notice in verse 6, it says, so, so when they had all come together, Acts 1, 6, when they had all come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? You can see where they're coming from now. You know, in the back of their mind, they're, th- they're, they're, they're basically saying in so many words, okay, Jesus, we, we, got, we got it now. We see what had to happen. You had to come. You had to pay the price for sin so that people could be inwardly forgiven so that you could outwardly set up a kingdom. But now you've done all of that. You've died. You've come back to life, praise God. So now is it the time to set up the kingdom? It seems like this would be a good time. So what does Jesus say? He answers them this way. In verse 7, if you look at it, he says, "'To them it is not for you to know the times and the seasons,' It has never been intended that it be merely a spiritual kingdom, so there will be no kingdom. Is that what he said? But you see, that's that's what he would have naturally said if our amillennial friends, our friends who believe there is no millennium, no thousand-year reign of Christ, if they if what they believed was true, that would have been this would have been the logical thing for him to say here. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that there will be no kingdom. Notice verse 7. He says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He didn't say it's not coming. He just said it's not coming now. It's for God to know, the Father to know, when this is all going to happen. In the meantime, there's a job for you to do, so get on with it. That's the message. There's a job for you to do to help participate in what will eventuate in the kingdom. And then, I mean, he's barely said this in what? He is lifted up out of their sight. The removal that Jesus had talked about. I have no doubt that as the disciples watched Jesus ascend into heaven that day, I mean, spectacular. I mean, their the minds must have been ruling, reeling at the things they had seen over the last, you know, two or three months, right? And suddenly here he is just, just ascending up into the clouds into the air. Their minds must have gone back to this parable about the nobleman going to receive a kingdom. And they knew that there was more to this story that they didn't totally understand even yet. But they would have thought about this parable that predicted this exact moment, the removal of the nobleman to a place where he will get the kingdom. So where did Jesus, where has he gone to the king, to, to receive a kingdom? What is the far country? We know, right? We know from other passages of Scripture, the far country to which Jesus has gone to receive a kingdom is heaven. Many passages of Scripture relate to this. Let's just take one. Ephesians 1, verses 20 and 21, says that God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority. So Jesus has his kingdom and now rules over all things. The Bible's very clear on this. Hebrews talks about this, how Jesus has the rulership over all things. Jesus told his disciples before he left, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, right? 
It's all in his hands. So why doesn't he come again? Why not now? And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. None of which we understand completely because certain things are for God to know and for us to find out, right? Deuteronomy 29 says that the 29.29 says the secret things belong to God. And that's one of the secret things. When is he coming again? Well, when will the time be right? All we know is that he certainly will. So the disciples didn't know that. They just knew that he was gone, but they also knew he, he had promised to come back again, and it was in, extremely important to them for them to know that in his absence, this was not the end of the story. This was just God implementing the plan that he had had from the beginning of time. And while they didn't fully understand it, in God's eternal, from God's eternal perspective, everything was right on time, right on schedule, happening exactly as it was supposed to happen. So we have the removal, number one, in this parable. Secondly, we have the representatives. We have the representatives. What are the disciples to do in Jesus' absence? They're to be his representatives. They're to continue the ministry that he started when he was here on earth, right? And this is where we get into the parable, right? Because the disciples have long ago come and gone, 2,000 years. There's been a lot of people in between, all of them fit in here because we're all part of the people that Jesus is talking about here are going to represent him on earth until he comes again, right? You didn't know you were in the Bible, but here you are if you belong to Christ. Verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minus and said to them, engage in business until I come. What was a mina? A mina was approximately three months salary of the, other, of the average person in those days. It's just representative, obviously, in this case. Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you something that will help you engage in business until I come. Not just any business, but his business, right? His business. He is bankrolling their efforts to attend to his interests. And what are his interests? Well, we've we saw that last week in Luke 19.10, right? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So what are our interests on his behalf to seek and to save those who are lost? Is that not true? That's our interests. Whatever else we're involved in, whatever else we do, wherever else the Lord takes us and puts us in whatever interests uh, uh, that we have, at the top of the heap, the ultimate one is what? To help other people know and have the opportunity to come to faith in Christ. We are to engage in business until he comes, and that's the business we are to engage in. So what does the mina represent? What are the tools, in other words, that God gives us to do that? Well, the first one, and the most important one, has to be what? The gospel. The gospel. The whole of the word of God, certainly, but, it, you know, Paul kind of reduces that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. To, Here's the gospel that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again for our sins. There's the gospel in a nutshell. It's what the whole Bible is ultimately pointing to. With the kids this morning, we saw how even in, back in Genesis 3, they, the same message is coming all the time throughout the pages of Scripture. This is the gospel, and God has given this. He's put, he's put this in trust to us. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, this is how one should regard us. This is how one should regard us, those who are believers, those who claim faith in Christ. How should you regard us? How should I regard you? How should you regard me? This is how we should be regarded as slaves. I know the word is servant in your Bible. It's slaves in the original language. As slaves of Christ and stewards representatives, fiduciary responsibility to what? To the mysteries of God. That is the gospel. That's the word of God. We're all responsible for making sure the gospel gets to people. Paul tells Timothy the same thing in, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 
14, he says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And if you go back to verse 8 in that chapter, you find out what the good deposit is. It's the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus died for your sins, that the only way to have a relationship with God is to come by faith in him and put your faith and trust in him. But you can have a relationship by doing that. The gospel, the good news, the word of God is the tool, one of the tools by which we can represent him and his interests here on earth. I think we probably can't exclude other things from that either. But the minas represent, if the, if the gospel is the major part of this, and I think it is, there's also what? So everything that the Lord gives us to represent him. Our giftedness. Whatever and whoever you are here this morning, God has made you gifted in a unique way because he's put you in a unique place so that you can face unique people and you are the unique person to bring the gospel to them. He's made some of us able to, you know, get up and speak. He's made some of us who couldn't get a word out if, if our life depended on it, but he's given us other gifts to relate to certain people so that they have an opportunity to know what Jesus is all about, to know what the gospel is, to know the good news of Jesus Christ. He's gifted us everything that he gives us, his word, his Holy Spirit, the, the, the natural and the spiritual gifts he gives, they're all part of the same package. They're all part of the minas, the bankroll that he's given us to go make clear the gospel of Jesus Christ to represent his interests here on earth First. Corinthians 4, verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? Everything we have is to be used for his glory, is to be used to exalt him, is to use to make him famous in the world, not us. We are his ambassadors, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's a full-time paid position, like a pastor or a teacher or a missionary, like Teresa going to Bangladesh, or whether it's somebody in a secular position, a nurse like Chelsea who goes to Greeley every day. Same calling to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever he places us and among whatever, he, whatever people he places us. Whatever else our business, whatever else we are attending to, this must be the first thing. We are his ambassadors. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore now we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We're his arms, his legs, his mouth, his means of making himself known in this world. By handing out cookies, whatever it takes. Ambassadors for Christ. Now, listen, how would you feel if, the, if, 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 I probably shouldn't ask this question, but I'm guessing if President Trump came along and said, I want to make you ambassador to Ireland, you'd probably say, whoa, what an honor, right? We'd all think that was an honor. Paul says, man, we're all ambassadors. We're ambassadors to planet Earth on behalf of God to make the gospel known. We're his representatives. So the disciples had a job to do, and so do we. That's our calling. So we have the removal. We have the representatives in the absence of the nobleman. What do we have next? We have the return. Return in verse 12. Jesus said a nobleman went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and then returned. In verse 15, when he returned, having received the kingdom. Has that happened yet? No. Jesus has not returned yet, right? The nobleman has gone. He's received the kingdom but he hasn't returned yet. But do you see that this parable is entirely irrelevant? It makes no sense. It shouldn't be in the Bible. Do you see that it makes no sense whatsoever unless Jesus is coming back again, right? This parable has no meaning apart from that. This parable is clearly teaching that Jesus is coming again. And beloved, he's going to come the same way as he went. He's going to come just as bodily visible as when he left. Same exact way. This nobleman returns. When he returns, what does he do? He interacts with his servants. He talks to them just like he did before. They see him just like they did before. They hear him just like they did before. It's the same interaction. 
Jesus is going to return in the same way that he left. You're going to be able to see him. You're going to be able to touch him. You're going to be able to experience Jesus because he's going to return. The nobleman is coming back. Listen, listen the Old Testament prophesies both the first coming and the second coming of Christ, does it not? Prophesies both of those. It doesn't say much about the age that's intervening, but it prophesies certainly the first coming and the second coming. If, here's my question, if the first coming was all, all the prophecies about the first coming were fulfilled literally, were they? How about the prophecy he was going to be born in Jerusalem? I mean, in Bethlehem, where was he born? Bethlehem. How about the prophecy that, uh, that his friend would betray him from Psalm 41? Is that what happened? Of course. Was it literal? So did it literally happen that he was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver like Zechariah 9? Yes. Did it happen that he was crucified as prophesied in Isaiah 22 and Isaiah 53? Yes, literally. Did it happen that he was raised from the dead like it says in Psalm 16 and in Isaiah 53? Yes. See, if the, if the, if the first coming was literal, the second coming has to be. Daniel called him in Daniel 7, he calls him the son of man, Jesus' favorite title for himself. Why? Because that emphasized how human he was, flesh, blood, and bones, right? Even after his resurrection, he said to the disciples, touch and feel me and see that I'm flesh, blood, and bones. He had a genealogy that went all the way back to Adam, according to Matthew. He's as much man as any of us are man or woman but yet fully God at the same time. Do you see? So it is absolute nonsense to say, as some do, many liberal churches, many cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and others say that Jesus' second coming is just kind of a secret spiritual thing. It is not true. The second coming of Jesus will be just as visible, just as real, just as much in the flesh, just as physical as his first coming. Otherwise, this parable makes no sense. If you're still in Acts, look at this. In, in verse 11, the, the angels who were there as Jesus was ascending into heaven, the angels said, in verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way. Why did he say that? So that we would understand how real it's going to be when he comes again. He's going to come in the same way that he, as you saw him go up into heaven. Yes, I know it all has to do with the clouds and he's coming in the clouds. We have First Thessalonians 4 and all that's true, but it also means you're going to see him. It was Matthew 25, same Matthew 25, verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds. It's going to be very real. It's going to be very physical. It's going to be very visible. You'll be able to hear it. You'll be able to see it. You'll be able to experience Jesus. Wonderful. Truths, are they not? It's going to come again. Jesus... It's coming again. You say, do you really believe that? Absolutely. I've staked my life on it. Jesus is coming again. I can hardly wait. I hope it's today. Don't you wish that? I'm, we're going to do something, you know, fun later this afternoon, but I hope Jesus comes first. I'd be happy to have him come. Come, Lord Jesus. John said, come. Come, Lord. You can't come soon enough. I want to see Jesus come. Jesus is coming again. If you believe that Jesus was visibly standing and talking and interacting with these men on this day, you have to believe that he's coming again. Same way. Same way. So we have the, what do we have? The removal. We have the, um, the uh, representatives. We have the return Fourthly, we have the results, the results, the results. Now, the results of Jesus' return visit are very different from those of his first coming. This is where there is a difference. This is where there's a significant difference. Jesus came the first time for what? To seek and to save those who were lost. He came to save. He said, I came not to condemn. 
came to die that the world through him might be saved. That's why he came the first time. But beloved, when he comes again, he's coming to judge. Different purpose. He's coming to reward those who have become his followers. He's coming to reward believers and to judge unbelievers. This is the nature of the second coming. It's very different from the first coming. It's when there will be a final and a fair accounting of the decisions that every person has ever made concerning Jesus Christ. Have you truly put your faith and trust in him, or are you still living your own script? It's coming of judgment. The results will be both glorious and devastating. Now, in order to fully understand what Jesus says here, we have to understand, and this is, this is something that's true throughout the Bible, and I've tried to emphasize this a few times um, we need, to, we need to get in mind, we think, we think of the world as being comprised of two kinds of people. I grew up believing the world is just two kinds of people, believers and unbelievers. And that's true. But there's actually three kinds of people that the Bible constantly makes reference to. There are believers and there are unbelievers, but there are two types of unbelievers that the Bible seems to really want to segregate. Okay, there, there are those, unbelievers eventually are condemned. But there are those who are condemned by their, by their badness, and there are those who are condemned by their goodness. And the Bible constantly makes a difference between those two people, two types of people, because it wants to make us understand you can sit in church and you can do all the right things and be an unbeliever. All three types of those people are here. They're in this parable. So I want us to see, I want you to, to watch with me as we go through this, the, the results of this parable to see that all three are there and you need to see where am I, how do I fit, all right? The first type are true believers, verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mind has made 10 miners more. And he said to them, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall be authority over 10 cities. Verses 18 and 19 describe a second person who is also such a believer. These are true people. These are people who have received Christ as Savior. They have joyously received the gift of life that he's given them. They've received the gift of the gospel that he has given them. They have embraced that. They've, re they've accepted the gift of, of, of giftedness that he has given them, physical and spiritual. They have done their best to represent him, and they are true believers. Their life has exhibited the fruit of the Spirit increasingly. They started out here, wherever they were, and they've reached here, and now God's going to take them clear up here. Others have started here, and they got to here, and Lord's going to take them. But the fruit of the Spirit is increasingly in their life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. It's one of the reasons you know you're saved, that there's more of that in your life now than there was when you came to faith in Christ. If you're, if you're the normal person that's going, you're becoming more curmudgingly as you get older, I, you may not be a Christian. Christians don't do that. They grow. They get better, not worse. It's part of the minus that God has given us. They're not perfect. None of us are. But they're pursuing God in their heart. It's his agenda, not theirs, that they are most interested in. They're interested in their agenda, yes. They're interested in being successful, yes. But mostly they're interested in that as it allows the fame and the fortune of Jesus Christ to be in increased on earth, as it blesses him, as it raises up his name. I mean, what are your goals? They tell me so much about your heart. These are rewarded. And notice they are rewarded out of all proportion to their faithfulness. I, I stand in amazement every time I read some of this in the Bible, but he says, faithful and little, Authority over much. We can't develop this fully this morning, but listen to some of the things the Bible has to say about those who are faithful, the rewards to the faithful. Revelation 3.21, Jesus says, the one who conquers I will grant to him, now listen to this, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne. Can you imagine sitting with Jesus on his throne? I, I can't. I, I can't, the best I could get is to be worshiping, bowing down before his throne. But he says, I'm gonna, you're going to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. That should cause us all to gasp and say, what? 
Faithful and little reward, rewarded much. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Wow. Do we deserve a reign with Christ on our best day? No. You know that, I know that. But we're going to do that as believers. Revelation 5.10, they shall reign on the earth. I can't tell you what that's all going to be like, beloved, but I, what, here's what I know. I know that if, if we knew now what we will know then, we would be a lot more faithful. We would want to make sure that we're doing the things that resound to the glory of God rather than the glory of Dave or whoever you happen to be. If there's any regret, even momentary in heaven, it'll be that we weren't more faithful. So that's the first group, true believers. How about the second group? Second group, simple. These are those who totally reject Christ, right? Those who, whether they, maybe they believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus. Maybe they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he really died for sins. Some other way to get to heaven. And so we find them in verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. These are the out and out rejectors of Christ. They may be down and outers in life or they may be up and outers in life. It doesn't matter. They want nothing to do with Jesus. Notice the phrase. It's particularly impressive. We do not want him to reign over us. Who do they want? They want self to be on the throne in their life. And they make no bones about it. I'm out for me. I'm out for number one. All you got to do is open up your browser, look at the newspaper, and you will find quote after quote after quote of this celebrity or that celebrity saying that same thing. But we all tend to say that, right? We're born saying that. I want to be my own boss. I will make my own way. I will be a self-made man or woman. And Jesus, I will save myself. Thank you. I'm glad for the example that he provided, maybe. Maybe I believe he was a good man, good prophet. But his death has no relevance to me. That's a rejecter. That's one who says, I will not have Jesus reigning in my life. Their fate is sealed when Jesus comes again, verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. It's figurative language for eternal separation from God. It's the destruction of sin. Sin always destroys. If it's not accounted for and paid for, it always destroys. Many of us have experienced that in our own lives. God has raised us from some depths that we have been in because of his love and because of his grace and because we have repented of those sins. But you keep going down that path and there's only one end and that's eternal destruction. So these first two people are polar opposites. Can you see that? We got the receivers and we got the rejectors. But what about the third kind of person? Where is that? Well, the third person is represented by the third servant. Third person is represented by the third servant in verse 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here is my mina which I kept away hidden in my handkerchief for I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you didn't deposit, reap what you didn't sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. Jesus isn't saying that the Lord's going to agree with him, but he's saying your own words tell me that you were an unbeliever. Your own words that I was a severe man taking what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow. Let me remind you, I sowed everything. <laughs> There's nothing I didn't sow. There's nothing that I didn't have a hand in. And you're telling me that's not true. That tells me where your heart is right now, right then. And then he goes on. <clears throat> he says, you knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. That was your opinion of me. So why then didn't you put your money in the bank at least in my coming that I might have collected it with interest? Many suggest, many of you probably had sermons on this, that this is just another servant, but he's just not a very faithful servant. Living kind of a wasted life. Got saved, put Jesus on the shelf, walked away, lived a wasted life. He's in, but he's in by the skin of his teeth. 
It's not what this is. It's not what this is. This is a person who has claimed Christ. This is a person who is a professor, but not a possessor of Christ. This is a person who probably thinks he is in. But Jesus is not part of his everyday life. He's a religious hypocrite. Jesus encountered them all on his journey. These are the Pharisees. Many of those around still today. How do we know that this person is not really saved? Well, first of all, Luke gives us the first clue in verse 20. He says, then another came. In the Greek language, there are two words for another. First one is the word alas, which means another of the same kind. That's not the word that Luke uses here. He uses the word heteros, heteros, another of a different kind. Another of a different kind. He's not like those other two servants. He's not a genuine servant at all. He's a person who's made a claim, but he's not real. He's had the word of God, yes, but he does not treasure it. He does not really believe it at its core. He's not made it a part of his life. He is not a servant of Christ. He has no relationship with Christ. He claims Christ, but he never thinks of him from Saturday to Saturday with these people as they went from Saturday to Saturday, Sunday to Sunday, today. No thought of Jesus, no relationship there. He's not, he's, he, you know, he even accuses God of being severe, accuses God of not playing fair. He's got an outward show of religiosity, no inward reality. Verse 22, Jesus refers to him as a wicked servant. The word wicked, paneros, it's never used in the New Testament. It's used 78 times in the New Testament. Never of a believer. Never of a true believer. This man is not a believer. This is a believer who looks good on the outside, but is perhaps even more evil than the worst person on the inside. It's hiding from everybody. He's even hidden from himself. Not a true believer. He's the elder brother of this story in Luke 15. We had the one guy that went away, right? Easy to spot him. Man, he's a sinner. He's out spending his money on prostitutes and all this kind of stuff. Unbeliever, not saved. But what about the elder brother? Equally unsaved. More verses devoted there in Luke 15 to him than to the younger brother. Why? Because Jesus is trying to warn the Pharisees who are the elder brother. They're the ones who are saying, but, we, but I stayed here and I did everything you wanted. Yes, but you did it out of a sense of duty. You did it so that you could say exactly what you're saying to me now. You owe me. God never owes anyone anything. Those are the three kinds. This is a false believer, the one who makes the claim of Christ, but he still loves and pursues his own will. His end isn't really stated here in detail, but it is in Matthew 25, where Matthew has the parable of the talents. It's a slightly different parable, but it's the same message, and it's the same lesson, and he actually uses even the same words in many cases. And he describes the last servant in the parable of the talents this way in Matthew 25, verse 30. Jesus says, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's no question about where that is, is there? You can be as religious as the day is long and go to hell. Because it isn't what you are on the outside that counts. It's who you are inside. It's not what you do that counts. It's what Jesus already did. And whether you accepted that as yours in your place or whether you're still trying to offer God that which will ingratiate you to him, you can't do that. You don't have enough goodness to do that. So each of us, I think, has to ask this morning, well, which group am I in? If Jesus came today, what would determine our fate? Which group are we part of? Are we part of group one? Those true believers who are, who are whatever else their life is involved around, whatever other career, whatever other students we are, whatever else we're doing, at the top of our list is how do I represent Christ? Is that us? Are we the 
true believer, the real servants, or are we the out and out unbelievers? Could you have those in church? Absolutely. You could be here because a family member wants you to come, but in your heart, you've rebelled against God. You're rebelling against Him. You know you're in rebellion. You don't believe Jesus? Who would believe that story? It's just pagan stuff. You could be in church and believe that. But more likely, if you're here but not a believer, you're in that third group, you've put on a good show. Been baptized through confirmation class. Come to church at least once in a while when it's not inconvenient. But not real, right? So, which group? We have to ask ourselves, if we're in the last two groups, we're on the broad road that leads to destruction. No time like today. Now is the day of salvation, Paul says. Now is the accepted time. No day like today to push through the door. Jesus says it's hard to push through that door. Why? Because you've got to leave pride behind. Get on the narrow road that leads to life. You can do that today by the confession of sin. The theme of this passage isn't difficult, right? It's stated right there in verse 26. I tell you, that to everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Who's the one who has? It's the one who has the gospel. It's the one who's embraced what the Bible says about Jesus. Someone, in simple terms, this is the one who has Jesus. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17 says. Do you have Jesus? The one who has, he's going to be given more than he ever dreamed. Faithful in little, authority over much. Amazing how Jesus will reward those who love him. But the great danger is to be self-deceived. Self-deceived, self-deception, you know, convincing yourself. Like the school teacher I read about, she's, she invested everything she had in a Ponzi scheme. You know, somebody came along, took a little of her money, returned, you know, 50% more within a couple of months. So, well, this is great. So she gave him everything she had. And, of course, that's the last she ever saw of him. So she went to the Better Business Bureau, and she, said, she told them what happened. And they said, well, why didn't you come to us first? Didn't you know we're here? She said, yeah, I knew you exist. But she said, I was afraid if I came and talked to you, you'd tell me not to do it. That's self-deception. Beloved, it's possible to sit here week after week after week and be self-deceived. You know, in your heart of hearts, you haven't really made that commitment to Christ. You're living for self first, and Jesus comes in somewhere down here, but Jesus won't take that place. He doesn't work that way. So I beg you, be reconciled to God. But for those of us who are true believers, what is our instruction here? Occupy till I come, as it says in the King James Version. Be about my business. Take the gifts I've given you. Take the gospel. Take the Holy Spirit. Take your natural giftedness. Use it for my glory. Let me ask you, you know, here's the question this leaves us with today. If Jesus does come this afternoon, she could. Are you going to be surprised or are you going to be ready? Don't be surprised. Be ready. That's why he gave you this parable. Now that he's given it to you, you're responsible, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness that you have given us this parable. We pray that we will take it seriously, that we will examine which group of people do I fall among, who am I really. And Lord, I assume most of us will find ourselves as true believers. I trust that. I know there are some who are not. I pray that you will bring them to yourself this morning, this very day. They will follow up, that they will find out how can I grow, how can I learn more about Jesus, about this faith, about the Word. For those of us who are here that know you, Father, I pray, would you please 
just, just impress upon our hearts again how important it is that we be about your business so that when you come, we are not ashamed. When you come, we know that we're being faithful. Thank you, Father, for the resources you give to us. Help us to use them so wisely, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.